Next, how will Putin respond to sanctions? Will it make him escalate or look for a diplomatic solution? Former counterterrorism official and novelist Richard Clark served three presidents on the National Security Council, and he joins Walter Isaacson to discuss the alarming threat of cyber war. Thank you, Christian and Richard Clark. Welcome to the show. Good to be with you, Walter. There are different levels of cyber attack, which Biden has warned us about, that could come along because of what's happening in Ukraine. The first is Russians using cyber warfare against the Ukrainians. To what extent has that happened, and what are we doing to help the Ukrainians? There's been a massive uh, Russian cyber attack uh, for a month now going on against Ukraine, against their military communication systems, and against their civilian infrastructure. Uh, the United States has uh, been helping behind the scenes, as have other European governments, and as have private sector companies, cybersecurity companies, helping Ukraine to restore services. Uh, but there is still an active war going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine in cyberspace. Give me an example of what's happening. Uh, Russian cyber attacks have knocked out uh, most of the government services uh, so that you can't, as a citizen of Ukraine, go online and communicate with your government, learn from your government. Uh, you can't access news very easily. You can't call 911. You can't get, call a hospital. Um, and on the military side, there's been a degradation of communications, uh, command and control in the Ukrainian military. Now, they've overcome a lot of that because it's been going on for over a month but it's the most significant Russian cyber attack on the country we've ever seen. Now, a lot of these attacks are done through vigilantes or cutouts in both ways. Sometimes the vigilantes, like Anonymous says, it's going after the Russians uh, sort of on behalf of the Ukrainians. <clears throat> They're volunteers probably in the United States trying to do denial of service attacks. I assume that's happening on the Russian side too. So tell me about this sort of unofficial proxy war. Well, the difference is that in Russia, the unofficial hackers uh, are known very well by the government uh, and do what the government wants them to do. Uh, so the, it's kind of a reserve army that the Russians have. Uh, in Europe and the United States, we have no control over the hackers, uh, white hat or, or gray hat or even black hat hackers. And <clears throat> there's a lot of activity. And we don't get to see the full dimension of that in, in media reporting, but it's happening. A lot of people in the United States and Europe are attacking Russian websites, primarily to get news to the Russian people. But there are also, as you say, denial of service attacks that are preventing uh, Russians from getting to essential services. This is a dangerous thing because it's not our government that's doing it. The Russians may or may not know that, but the Russians may mirror image and think that the United States government, the Europeans and, and their governments are trying to get the hackers to do this. So in other words, the hackers doing it on behalf of uh, Ukrainians, uh, sort of white hat American hackers doing this could get on a slippery slope or a way that this just spins out of control. Yeah. And uh, should we stop them from doing it, or is there some advantage to having them do it? <clears throat> I, would, I would ask them not to do it. Uh, it's better if the government controls uh, the level of tax that we do on other countries. We don't want to give the Russians an excuse uh, or a reason for attacking our cyberspace. Yeah. So far, they haven't done that, uh, but they could. And we don't want to make it easier for them to justify that we don't want to provoke it. You just said that they haven't attacked our cyberspace. We have not yet had an official Russian attack on cyberspace in, in the United States. Biden has issued warnings that it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Tell me where you think it might happen and why is Biden is issuing these warnings? Well, Biden says he has evolving intelligence that the Russians are planning to do that. Uh, our intelligence agencies, particularly NSA, probably have the capability of watching the Russians set up for attacks, uh, some of them at least, uh, and therefore might be able to block them, but not all of them. And the attacks could come in two kinds. 
They could be targeted after specific infrastructures like, for example, what if they went after uh, the colonial pipeline again, uh, as they did, uh, as Russian hackers did earlier. Uh, and instead of $5 a gallon, our gas was $10 a gallon. Uh, what if they went after the refineries? So they, they could be the, these targeted attacks. <clears throat> they could also do indiscriminate attacks, like a, what's called a software supply chain attack. Uh, they once went after Russian military intelligence, once went after a company called SolarWinds, uh, which supplied software to 14,000 companies. And in the software they supplied, the Russians inserted malware that allow the Russians to get into those companies, a sort of backdoor, uh, a very sophisticated backdoor. So they could do that, in which case uh, they wouldn't know, probably, uh, all the companies that would be hit. They wouldn't know all the effects that would happen. Do you they think also... some of that malware is still in corporate oh, yeah. servers? Absolutely. And how, how would a corporation figure out <clears throat> the Russians to put malware in? They probably couldn't. Uh, we were very lucky in the case of Solar Winds that a company called FireEye Mandiant uh, discovered it almost by chance because they were one of the people who got the software and they noticed, one of their people noticed a slight anomaly. Uh, it had been going on for months and no one had noticed. And, and frankly, I do not believe that Solar Winds was the only company that they did that to. So I think they are probably already have backdoors into thousands of American companies. Do you think that we have backdoors into their companies? Oh, most certainly, most certainly. Uh, and into their infrastructure, uh, things like their power grid and whatnot. But if we are attacked by them, let's say, and they knock off the power grid in the central Atlantic region, for example, uh, I'm not sure if I lose power yeah. uh, <clears throat> here in Virginia, it's going to make me feel any better to know that people in Novo Sibirsk don't have power either. Uh, and there's an asymmetry. We are much more dependent uh, as an economy uh, on our technical infrastructure, on the cloud, on the internet, than the Russian economy is. So should it be our doctrine, and is it our doctrine, that if they attack our infrastructure, such as our electricity grids, uh, using cyber, we can attack back, not just using cyber, but using kinetic, real, physical attacks? Well, that is our doctrine. That's been the Pentagon's doctrine for over 10 years, that we will judge the nature of the attack by the effect, uh, the magnitude of the effect, not by the method. And therefore, we reserve the right uh, uh, as a government to respond to a major cyber attack in any way. Now, that's why it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked earlier about the slippery slope of vigilantes. There's also this more significant one, which is people think cyber war uh, is antiseptic. It's clean. There are no body bags. But it could very quickly lead to a kinetic war if the damage gets significant. And the damage can get significant just because we haven't seen that happen, uh, because there hasn't yet been a major cyber war between two powers. That doesn't mean it won't happen. It doesn't mean it won't be very significant if it happens. So cyber war is not a safe, uh, no body bag kind of approach. It's in fact an escalation. We have rules, we have doctrines, and so do the Russians, that we've all known, that we've negotiated over 50 years, whether it be conventional forces in Europe or tactical nuclear weapons. What do we use? Do we have doctrines and do we have rules of the road? Do we have Geneva Conventions about the use of cyber weapons? And if not, should we? We don't. Uh, lawyers will tell you that the Geneva Convention applies to any weapon uh, and therefore perhaps the cyber weapons. But no, the answer is no. We, we have never worked out the rules of cyber war uh, because we don't want to reveal what we could do uh, and neither do the Russians or anybody else. Uh, if we get into a cyber war with them, this will be the first major cyber war between two powers. It is terra incognita. We don't know what the rules are. We don't know what would happen. Are those uh, rules that are sort of vague covered by NATO, and specifically Article 5, which says any attack on a NATO country is an attack on all of us NATO countries? For example, if there were some cyber interference in Poland, 
do you think this would trigger a NATO response and that would help escalate this war? The NATO Secretary General, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, has addressed that issue, uh, and he has said yes, that cyber war is covered um, by the NATO uh, mutual defense arrangement, the so-called Article 5, so that if there were a major cyber attack on Poland, NATO would consider that an attack on all NATO's 30 nations. Do you think that we should have uh, methods to respond to a cyber attack short of using real physical force that would be an effective response? In other words, <clears throat> a major cyber attack on them that would be uh, more than commensurate? Biden has said publicly uh, that we would respond in kind, at least initially. Uh, he didn't say at least initially. He said we could respond in kind. And I have reason to believe that we have packages already designed, uh, somewhat like the, the list, the menu uh, of nuclear options. We have a menu of cyber options that the president could choose from. Well, wait, give me a couple of examples of that so we know what you're talking about. Well, would you like to turn out the electric power grid? Uh, would you like to turn it out in Moscow? Would you like to turn it out in Siberia? Would you like to blow up their pipelines? Would you like to derail trains? Would you like to bring down their air traffic control system and make it impossible for them to fly? Uh, would you like to bring down their telephone system, their stock market? Uh, there's a whole series of things that we could do with cyber weapons, uh, and we probably have the plans and capability to do that. What should we be worrying about for our election coming up? The Russians have already shown a propensity to meddle with our elections. So the Russians have this concept of hybrid warfare, uh, which is warfare short of uh, conventional attack. And the two key elements of hybrid warfare are what we've been talking about, cyber war. And the other one is disinformation and creation of a so-called fifth column, uh, people inside the country to whip up dissent. Frequently, those people don't know that they're being used by foreign powers. But I think it's pretty clear that Russia has, through its disinformation arm, been feeding talking points, been feeding information to Americans that sometimes show up, in fact, frequently show up on some mainstream media. And that perhaps some of the people involved in the January 6th insurrection were unwilling dupes uh, of disinformation. We can expect to see more of that kind of thing as the tensions between the United States and Russia get higher. Are you saying that some of the people we see on TV spouting talking points supporting Russia or denigrating Ukraine are either unwilling or even willing dupes of uh, Russia or been supplied misinformation by Russia? Certainly, they're at least unwilling or unknowing. Uh, some of them might know. But you can track uh, talking points that originate on Russian sites, migrate to the extreme right-wing sites in the United States, uh, and then migrate from the extreme right-wing sites into certain congressmen uh, and senators, and from there onto certain uh, television networks. Can you be a little bit more specific on that? I mean, yeah, give me an example. Uh, you can see stories, for example, the Russians have been trying to put out a story that the United States uh, was helping Ukraine develop biological weapons, which is pure nonsense. Uh, that begins on Russian sites. Uh, and it, we've now been able to monitor that moving into certain right-wing sites in the United States. Uh, and certain commentators have begun discussing, well, you know, was that, is there any truth to that? Uh, these ideas permeate and they flow from Moscow's disinformation program, which is extensive and elaborate and very well established and old, uh, into countries all around the world. They don't just do this to us. There's a big controversy now, especially in Israel, in all the papers, <clears throat> about uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky of, U of Ukraine, asking for Pegasus, which is a system that allows uh, uh, a country to hack into cell phones, which the Israelis have, and the Israelis saying, no, we're not going to sell it to you. Uh, to what extent is that a real problem, and what type of software like that should uh, those, of, uh, those countries rooting for Ukraine be willing to sell to Ukraine? 
Well, Israel has very surprisingly and very disappointingly uh, pretended to be Switzerland in this conflict. Even the Swiss haven't pretended to be Switzerland. But Israel has uh, maintained neutrality. And so they're not selling arms and they say they're not selling cyber weapons. Pegasus is a system that would allow uh, Ukrainian intelligence to get into specific cell phones. And we know that the Russian commanders are using cell phones to communicate because somebody, and I assume it's Ukraine, has interfered with their uh, regular communications, their encrypted communication system. I don't think it'll make a big difference uh, that they don't have Pegasus. They're already apparently following the location uh, of Russian generals by intercepting their cell phone signals. I know that you were very close to, and certainly uh, we all miss, uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright. I remember seeing you all together at times. I was just wondering now, uh, as we all mourn her passing, if you have any particular memory of her you'd like to share. Oh, so many. Um, uh, I, I absolutely love that woman. She had such grit, uh, such determination, uh, such courage, and she was such an American patriot, even though uh, she was born and, and spent the first 10 years of her life in, in what was then uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, I, I could go on all night, but uh, I, one moment sticks in my mind. We were sitting in her office at the UN when she was the UN ambassador, uh, and we were complaining about uh, Secretary General Boutrous Ghali and, and how ineffective he was and how, and frankly, anti-American he was. Uh, and somebody said, um, I think it may have been Jamie Rubin, said, well, you know, he has to be reelected this year for his second term. And Madeline looked at me and I looked at her and there was a twinkle in her eye. And she said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> and I said, uh, it's going to be hard to deliver the president. It's going to be hard to deliver the uh, <clears throat> Washington to, we may be the only one that opposes him. Uh, and she looked at me and she said, but we have a veto. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Richard Clark, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Walter.